And um, yeah, now I'm happy to announce our uh, closing panel for this section, um, which is uh, called Digital Euro and Identity of Things as an Accelerator for Industry uh, 4.0. Uh, um, and um, is Harry Behrens also uh, in the right Zoom? Okay, great. So. Then I'm happy to hand over to Professor Philip Sandner, who is the chair of the panel. Thank you, Manuel. Very nice. Uh, and let's directly start with the panel. With this panel, we wanted to focus on the intersection of the digital euro, identity management um, and IoT, because we see that in this area things are blending, uh, right? Um, IoT needs identity and might need digital euro to execute payments and so on. So the machine economy of the future will be a mixture between IoT devices, um, IoT interfaces, for example, Infineon, identities that would be cast from Serity and potentially also execution of payment that would be the digital euro. That's exactly how we specified this panel. But we know and acknowledge that it's, of course, a very broad topic, we could have an entire conference on this topic, but now we have 25 minutes. Um, maybe everybody here in the room, please present yourself brief, briefly, also your company, and uh, how do you fit in here, focusing on identity or IoT or um, uh, other topics. Carsten, would you like to get started? Yo, um, maybe you should ask the question again, Philip. <laughs> Uh, what's your name and what's the company? That's the question. It's an easy one. Well, easy question. Yeah, my name is Carsten Stöcker and the company is Sferity. And at Sferity, so we are looking to decentralize digital identity solutions for B2B and B2B2C use cases and primarily in regulated industries because we like to work with digital signatures and it's a very handy tool for regulated industries such as energy, pharma, food and e-commerce. Excellent. So that's the identity perspective. Okay, who who's next? Maybe Harry. Harry, would you like to take over? Yes. So Harry Behrens. Until two days ago, I was heading the blockchain factory at Daimler Mobility. We did a management buyout now, took the software uh, that we developed and uh, deploying it now at Blocksmove. So we're building a transaction platform, which is based on decentralized technologies, decentralized identifiers, decentralized or shared ledger. And the aspect here is basically devices are being put to service. You need the identities to prove what is happening, who did what with whom, uh, as the basis for then accounting and booking correctly where the distributed ledger would come in. As to digital euro or digital currency in general, I'm still open. I don't think that's been decided yet. So I would definitely say all of this will need micropayments, which are ultimately done with digital currencies or digital value token. If necessary, a digital fiat currency is the appropriate answer. I believe that should be an open discussion. Okay, excellent. So, uh, Harry, today you have your coming out, so to say. Uh, you had Indeed. Daimler Mobility uh, until... Monday and since yesterday, uh, I think you switched the job, right? And uh, of Correct. course, this was a long planning and you apparently um, management bought out some uh, IP and tech from Daimler, if I got this right. Correct? Daimler Mobility, correct, yes. Yes, okay. Daimler Mobility, that's absolutely right. Okay, who's next? Uh, maybe Markus, would you like to take over? Yes, sure. Uh, so, my name is Markus Müssenbacher. I'm working at Infineon Technologies. Infineon comprises of four Uh, segments of uh, for uh, business lines, automotive, uh, industrial power and control, power and sensor systems, and uh, connected secure systems. Uh, and my position as a product marketing manager head uh, is in connected secure systems, and I'm responsible for secure card solutions, uh, identity solutions. Uh, and we see a big need in industry 4.0 Uh, when all the machines and identities will be connected, uh, that everyone is aware and also uses high security products. Excellent. So this is another perspective of identity, but not so much the, not so much the software part, but rather the, the chip manufacturing part at Infineon. Okay, Helge, uh, would you like to present yourself briefly? Yes. 
Thank you. Uh, my name is Helge Steinweg. I'm an in-house lawyer at Deutsche Telekom, one of Europe's uh, biggest tele telecommunication providers. I am specializing in IT law, data privacy law, and regulatory law in this capacity. I'm advising my colleagues on our blockchain activities. Uh, currently, we are, for example, knee-deep in assessing the legal aspects of running validators for permission blockchains the field that we've been expanding into and we've been hearing a lot about in the last two and a half days that was really, really interesting and this relies on proof of stake so this is kind of like the engine room further i'm a legal advisor to our iot and connected car unit and this is really why the topic of this panel fits fits perfectly because when you consider that that we as telecom are providing the connectivity for the iot and the industry 4.0 we look at the identities from, from two angles. You know, On the one hand, we need to know to some extent who's operating a certain device, a certain car. I'm sure Harry can sing a song about that. And uh, in case law enforcement authorities ask us you know, who it is. And uh, so we cannot allow ourselves to not know who is responsible for a certain device that has our SIM card in it. On the other hand, this has been discussed extensively as well today. Privacy law forbids us to some extent from storing too much personal data. So this is the perspective I hope to bring to this panel today. This is why blockchain-based uh, solution for identity is something we find really interesting and I've seen some very promising approaches here today. Perfect. And finally, we have Mark from Define. Please also over to you. Yes, thank you. My name is Mark Henniges. I have a background in physics and machine learning and have been with the consultancy Define for almost nine years now. I'm a manager in our blockchain practice and as such have seen many different projects in the space in tokenization, paper use, CBDC and also SSI identities. Um, so as uh, we are a, a large consultancy here in Europe and we usually combine the business analyst role with the programmer role in our projects, we get a very project driven view uh, with many different clients on all these kinds of topics. And uh, we see where all these things connect. And I'm hoping to bring that view into this panel today. Thank you for that. Excellent. So concerning IoT and blockchain, uh, we know that blockchain has a nice aspect of uh, bringing the digital twin aspect into IoT devices. So basically mapping things onto a blockchain system. And these promises have been out there now since a couple of years. But um, my feeling is that not too much has happened. I know there are multiple prototypes and first uh, products being launched and so on. But a hype or a rush towards this technology uh, should feel different. Therefore, question to every one of you, maybe we start with Carsten, where are we with regard to IoT plus blockchain um, and why don't we see much more in the field? One additional sentence for me, there should be apparently 20 billion, 20 billion devices by 2025 according to estimations. Now we have 2021. And uh, I don't see the curve actually uh, coming. Uh, maybe the estimation was wrong. Um, but let's also Have a, have a look at that and reflect on this. Uh, Carsten, please start. Where are we? Is it all progressing? Um, is it progressing as we wish? Or could it go faster? Yeah, from, from our perspective, there are a lot of, as you mentioned, as proof of concepts and maybe some little field tests being, being done together with blockchain and IoT. Uh, for example, the Deutsche Energieagentur, the DENA, is doing a lighthouse project for the German government. The German government said, hey, let's 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 do a blockchain project in the energy space and it's a so-called blockchain machine identity ledger. And uh, similar projects are being done in the automotive industry. I think every German OEM built, built already a, a prototype and did a little field test of putting blockchain wallets into cars and then kind of, and even the energy companies such as Energy, where I was, doing the uh, charge pool transactions and kind of to, to disrupt the roaming, um, the charging roaming um, business model. But I think when, when you look in the, in the problem to be solved, it's easy to take an IoT device and to put a little bit of software into it and then to put some key management into it and then to make the IoT device to sign something. However, having said this, the challenge is still, and this was a Nobel Prize winner who said this to me, in the end, you need end-to-end -end identity supply chains. Yeah? And this means this starts with, let's say, the GS1 or the Glyph that's saying that the manufacturer of an IoT device is a manufacturer of ID IoT devices, Bosch is Bosch. And then Bosch has a lot of subsidiaries and Bosch has different machines. And then the machine is producing other IoT device or an object. 
And then the machine is creating a digital certificate, a birth certificate, a certificate of conformity, validation, testing, some other certificates about this. And this, this requires a lot of retrofitting and integration work. And that's still still not yet feasible to really do it end to end from a from a from an identity issuer down to the machine and uh, all the entire supply chain. That's such a big challenging task. And our take is so basically kind of to continue doing do some research on an IoT and blockchain and identity, but more focus on objects because objects are pretty much similar. So it's just a single object. It's not a product configuration configuration tree of an entire car. You have much, much, much less complexity. And with objects, a pharmaceutical product, you can retrofit one ERP system or MAS system that issues certificates. Then you have hundreds of millions of, of pharmaceutical products. This scales nicely. Object doesn't produce any IoT data. It's more simpler. And that's a bit our take. That kind of, let's say, you better you start more simple. Start with object identity, object digital twin, and then kind of do the IoT piece afterwards. Because from an end-to-end -end identity supply chain, or, um, yeah, this, that's, that's still a very, very big challenge. Okay, interesting uh, viewpoint. Um, Harry, what about you? Uh, where are we with regard to IoT and blockchain? And why don't yes. we proceed faster? Well, there is, if you look at IoT in general, I believe IoT is actually quite widespread in general. So there's a lot of communicating devices in a lot of factories, and there's a lot of sensor-driven machines, containers, cars. Every modern truck is equipped with quite sophisticated internal telematics and uh, interconnected vehicles. So it's not that IoT doesn't exist. So it's already quite well and alive. So what is maybe missing is this kind of dream picture of, yes, IoT is completely integrated with DIDs and that's completely integrated with blockchain. So for that, you do not see too many cases. And uh, there's essentially the two reasons as far as I'm concerned. And I know I'm making myself relatively unpopular in the digital identity scene, but I keep on saying that identity per such is not a use case. It's not a business. It's just something that you need. So people that pursue identity for identity's sake will never end up building anything useful. Just like a personal device is not a business case. It's just something that you have. And a lot of the energy that I see in the DID and SSI world seems to be doing precisely that. So what I'm trying to say here is this will only be come to success if you look at it from the pragmatic in the sense of what can we do this? What can we do with this? What transactions do we have? What's the business? And in the business, when I book the record, when I make proof of delivery of service, when I need to prove a certain pre-qualification, then I will find many situations in which, where it's preferable, easier, efficient, saving me money profitable to be definitely sure that I can one-to-one -one identify the counterparty device that I'm interacting with. Okay. If you approach it from that, it'll grow organically. And that's where I see the future. I really do not see the future on this pull by let's make DID or SSI an intergalactic global standard because that's leading nowhere. That's Elfenbein to them, as you say in German. Okay, good point. Um, Mark, what about you? Bit, what's, what's your point on IoT and blockchain? When will it, at some point of time, meet each other? Uh, yes, thank you. So uh, we do a lot of POCs with our clients. They're all looking into that, uh, how to connect uh, IoT with DLT, with blockchain, how to, in, how to integrate payments uh, and so forth. And what we see a lot that uh, is that Many of these use cases are very specific as to one use case, of course, that's fine for a POC, but they usually include one party each. So there's one banking partner, there's one industry partner, there's one uh, identity partner, um, and it's usually not... Um, not a project in the blockchain -y sense that you include more people from the same field into these POCs. So what I would argue is that uh, the network effect is missing here. We, uh, we see a strong trend to people being very secretive about their infrastructure. They do not want to share too many secrets about how they do things. And that's why they would rather, instead of taking a second bank into the project or taking a second partner from the industry into the project, focus on one counterparty, focus on one payment provider. Um, and this is, I think, something that we will find many, many 
little solutions in the future, in the very near future, um, and not so much an integrated solutions, uh, integrated solution, not so many standards. Uh, we see lots of smaller use cases being built by very small consortia. And what I would encourage is really for people to go for a consortia, to go for larger um, um, networks when you do proof of concepts, such that we can speed things up by providing new standards, by creating uh, yeah, well, by, get, by getting things up to speed a little more, I think that's something uh, I can add here. So, so, so let me um, recap um, on on this. So, identity is missing, standardization is missing, prototypes is missing. Uh, probably also the question is who can provide identity? Should it be ident um, Should it be infrastructure providers such as the government? Is it companies? So, it it feels like there is a lot. Uh, missing at this point of time. So therefore, let's turn a little bit to the future. How do you think will this develop in the future? You know, will this fit together in the foreseeable future, or um, or maybe, um, yeah, is this uh, is the fit just on PowerPoint, uh, but uh, on a deeper level when you need to implement it? then it's simply not possible because complexities are too high, things are missing, standardization is missing, and so on. So how would you say um, is this going on in the future? Maybe, Markus, do you have an opinion here? Yeah, so first, um, uh, to, to, um, to see the difference between uh, the current status, so currently we have, uh, we need to differentiate between uh, digital identity for persons, so office IT, and digital identity for production, so also called OT, operation technology. So everything is already available today, but uh, the issue is it's not standardized. So every company has a proprietary solution for um, digital identity of persons, uh, for digital identity of objects, for machines. There are just IP and MAC addresses used. Uh, and in future, uh, the technology will change to 5G, uh, so um, which means uh, that there will be new standards required for smart factories. Uh, and there is also a program uh, planned on the European Union, the European Union ID, uh, which uh, where standards like uh, W3C, SSI, GSMA, OpenID Connect, and others are expected. Uh, and, and this will be um, a challenge and, and also a big opportunity um, to get a better standardization for, for industry 4.0. Uh, and what is also very important is that all these uh, objects and identities are securely connected. Yeah, this is absolutely correct. And uh, Helge, what about the regulatory perspective? Um, is more work needed here on behalf of the regulator concerning data protection and other things? Or have you proceeded so far that basically the ball is um, in the field uh, of the industry? Yeah? So who, who needs to act here? The government, the regulator concerning data protect protection and other things? Or um, is it with the companies the duty to now push this topic? Well, I think the, the most important the question is, or the most important task is to, to really take the public authorities on board with us. Because um, to add to that, what my what the other colleagues shared before, I think I also think that the interoperability is is a huge problem right now. And making these different devices and different standards interoperable is really in everyone's interest. Also, telecoms. You know, we want the IoT sector to succeed. Succeed. You don't have to use our web, web, web or uh, network at all times. You can use another one. But the more IoT devices that use the connectivity, the better. It's an, it's an ecosystem and the more participants, the better. But, and this leads to your uh, question, Philip, we are held by high standards by the regulatory authorities. I just cut into that. You know, To some extent, we need to know the identity of the people operating a certain SIM card. So I can only say there are some very promising out, uh, 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 use cases out there, but we need to take the authorities on board because in the end, if they say, no, this is not enough for me, you know, I need to have the identity of a certain person, I need to have it definitely, then we're going to have a problem and then we're going to resort to good old storage, you know, in, in our own service, which we don't even want. You know, we're, we're happy to, to use a good blockchain um, use case, but I think we need to really take them on board. And, um, you know, what, what Helga described earlier, uh, the, the German ministries, they are on board, uh, but we have to also trickle that down also to the uh, supervisor authorities, kind of like Bundesnetzagentur and so on. 
Okay, Mark, would you like to add something on the topic of interoperability? We, we discussed this earlier that this is an issue um, which is also leading uh, companies to maybe act uh, slower than they than they could. Uh, yes, and I think uh, one major uh, point in the in the era of interoperability is how you handle payments in all these different networks, uh, and maybe to uh, cross the bridge a bit into the digital euro and the, the payments part here. Um, we we see a lot that uh, when it comes to IoT, when it comes to all these different kinds of POCs, that payments is always an issue. You need the euro in a network, you need the euro on the blockchain. And it seems that many people are turning to the ECB and waiting for them to finally um, issue the euro on the blockchain. And I think that is something we shouldn't really wait for. Uh, it's not like the ECB will at some point run blockchain nodes for all possible blockchains in their basement to issue a euro on all different blockchains. So if we want to have payments in these different networks, uh, we can build solutions today. And uh, if we involve enough parties, uh, then we will have a standardization for all this and it will be easy to plug in payments to any blockchain, to any network. And I think that is something that is very much needed uh, for interoperability between uh, blockchains, between different networks, between different use cases. We need um, a, a means of payment that I can use and accept in one uh, network and also in another. Yes, and here we have Deutsche Telekom now collaborating with uh, Celo. Uh, maybe Helge, uh, could you add a little bit of more background what what's happening here? It's interesting that, for example, Deutsche Telekom as an yeah, infrastructure provider is investing in an or collaborating this way with a financial service provider. And, for example, I ask my, myself, why is not Deutsche Bank collaborating with Celo and the Celo Euro. Why, why is it Deutsche Telekom? I think this is interesting that this is driven by uh, the industry. But maybe, Helge, uh, please add some details. Uh, yes, exactly. I mean, we just recently uh, invested in, in Celo, which, which is a, a stable coin. And um, it can be used to conduct financial transactions, also, also microtransactions. The question is exactly why are we in it? Well, because it operates on the proof of stake basis. And that means that the validators have to be trustworthy and not everyone can validate. So it's not proof of work. So, you know, you have to be trustworthy to do it in the beginning. And that's kind of like, of course, where we see ourselves, you know, we do the secure and reliable computing in our own cloud infrastructure centers. And that is, I, I described this as the engine room earlier. You know, this is kind of where we see ourselves. You know, we're happy to run the, the, the validator nodes for you. And um, I mean, we also have an investment arm in our, of course, in our group. So, you know, they, they also did look at this at investment, but mainly we, we see it as the as a IT work. You know, we do the work in the background for you. You guys have some great uh, uh, use cases out there, some great business cases, and we're happy to run the validators. Okay. And um, Harry, I think the mobility ecosystem you're planning to build should also involve some payments at a later point in time, right? So how do you plan uh, to get this done, uh, being done as basically connecting IoT and payments? Well, basically, actually, you can simplify it because if you look at what companies care about, they do not count the cash. What you count is book money. That's what matters. Your P&L and your balance sheet are always expressed in book money. So the much more important part is to manage the liabilities. And that is distributed ledger. By doing that, you can do it seamlessly, frictionless based on Corda technology, for instance. The Commerzbank, I see the poster behind you, the Commerzbank is using uh, Corda. And it's a very powerful way to do frictionless bookkeeping. And I believe the frictionless settlement, which is the cash component of it, is actually secondary and will be very easy once the frictionless micro bookkeeping is set up. So my take on this, start with frictionless, fully digital shared bookkeeping based on distributed ledger, which you can do in micro amounts, and then worry about the actual cash settlement later. I believe that's a much more pragmatic and much less complicated route to take. Okay, interesting point. Carsten, would you like to add um, a closing word uh, here, maybe calling for like a joint effort in Europe, um, that we need to really push this topic on identity, payment, and so on. Um, does this make sense, or how how do you see this here progressing? I also want to add, for example, there is there is a big large scale integration of decentralized identity already now being rolled out. Yeah, and that's the that's the European Digital Certificate for COVID credentials. Yeah for vaccination passes or some test passes. And that's interesting 
So it's not a full-fledged decentralized identity solution. It's, let's say, a decentralized identity solution version one, but it has issuers, holders, wallets, and verifiers. So all the kind of the mechanics of full-fledged decentralized blockchain identity are already embedded in the European digital certificate. And I think people have understood the business benefits of how to do it. And I think the big problem is not so much technology, it's more kind of the business people. Because when business people move in and they really see a business case and the benefit, then they adopt it. And what we do in US, that's put in this thing. So when we have our sales meeting to sell our compliance product license, then the, then the business people don't even ask us what blockchain are you using, what interop protocol are you using. They don't care. They care that that's, that is a compliant and secure solution to solve their business problem. And I think that's also part of crossing the chasm to really kind of, let's say, move this technology out of a, a technical interop discussion and whatever discussion and crypto primitive discussion into into a business um, business business conversation about the value that's being provided here and the value and I think people are just starting to understand the entire value in, of credentialing and open systems and I think that's that's that needs to be accelerated and of course the government um, by pushing forward such, such such things can accelerate it and we have seen it that it could work when governments do it with the um, European Digital Green Pass yeah, for vaccination credentials. Yeah, let's see what happens. Um, sometimes I'm very optimistic because, you know, you see the estimations, you see the numbers, how they should grow and um, and then you look at the government and say so they should do more and even more so before you are doing more you first have to understand what's going on and sometimes i think that's 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 really lacking uh, with uh, senior government uh, officials but uh, that's just my personal opinion thanks very much um, it was a tough topic complicated one um, but i still think given the estimations to some degree they will come so therefore it will be a growing area um, in worldwide also in europe uh, talking about the machine economy and therefore thanks to everyone here in the panel and then i now hand over back to Manuel. Thanks. Thank you. Thank Thanks you. a lot. Goodbye. Good team. You're all by inspiring us. Take care. <laughs> Thank you, Philip. Yeah, I think that was an amazing uh, closing panel, which uh, I think uh, tackled all uh, aspects that we have heard uh, before in the presentations of this uh, section. Now we have a, a really short bio break from uh, two minutes, I think, and then we are back and opening the new section.